Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Carvin, and I'm Senior Fellow at the Digital Forensic Research Lab, or DFR Lab, in Washington, D.C. We're part of the Atlantic Council, which is a think tank that focuses on international relations and international relationships. And our team specifically looks at the role of the Internet and how it can be used either to strengthen or in sometimes threaten democracy. And given the nature of how the internet has played out in recent years, it's not too surprising to learn that we spend a lot of time thinking about disinformation and misinformation, who's behind it, what their motivations are and how it affects society. And since the beginning of this year, much of our work has focused specifically on COVID-19 related disinformation. From the very earliest days of the virus, uh, from literally the first days that there were rumors spreading in China that something was happening in Wuhan, there have been uh, rumors and conspiracy theories and people trying to guess what's going on. And that initial trickle of rumors has become a flood that has penetrated every country in the world at this point. So much so that the World Health Organization has described what they call an infodemic, which they define as an overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, that makes it hard for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when they need it. Think of it this way. As the virus has spread and gone from one country to another and gone from a single outbreak to uh, a pandemic, information travels with it. People act as super spreaders. There are rumors that become uh, mutated and spread over time as well. And so in a lot of ways, when we think about misinformation and disinformation, whether it's related to COVID or in other contexts, you have to think about epidemiology because the patterns are fairly similar in how information picks up like a virus. And so over the last year, we've conducted nearly 80 case studies specifically on how COVID-19 disinformation has spread around the world and how it's played out in different countries. And we've started seeing patterns um, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. They, they sometimes overlap with each other. But nonetheless, I think it's worth spending a little bit of time looking at what these patterns are, because I think it can tell you a lot about the state of disinformation today and why certain actors feel it's necessary to conduct it and why people are vulnerable to it. So one of the first types of disinformation that we saw play out was uh, what you'd probably call information suppression. This is simply the act of governments and other entities trying to crack down on the spread of reliable and accurate information. In the earliest days of coronavirus breaking out in China, the Chinese government did its best to, uh, uh, to curtail information. They arrested journalists and detained doctors. And because of that, valuable weeks were lost in understanding what was happening and how it was going to spread. But they're certainly not the only ones who've been caught doing such things. Uh, Moscow, for example, in the early days of the outbreak uh, in Russia, at first the Kremlin denied that there was any issue happening in the country. But all you had to do was go on VK or Instagram or other social networks and search locations through geolocation. And you would see supermarket shelves that had been uh, stripped bare because of panic buying uh, and people fighting over groceries and the like. And so uh, governments have gone out of their way to play down the seriousness of, of the pandemic. We've also detected a whole range of financial scams. These are less traditional uh, disinformation um, cases uh, that don't necessarily have to do with geopolitics, but still affect people in significant ways because they're trying to defraud people through panic. Uh, early on in the pandemic, we saw examples of people creating Facebook groups that were labeled as infor information, sparing, information sharing spaces about COVID-19, but they were really designed to scare people and to scare people into buying products that different companies were selling, uh, masks and the like. 
Later on, we saw another example of disinformation where a uh, company in South Africa was claiming that people uh, could get uh, people who were out of work, for example, because of uh, uh, COVID-19 could receive uh, coupons from local supermarket chains if they called a phone number or, or contacted an email and shared personally identifiable information. So, of course, those coupons had nothing to do with actually helping people. It was purely a scam to collect people's private information. Unfortunately, these types of financial scams have been everywhere because there are always profiteers trying to uh, piggyback on top of a crisis. At a whole other level, though, you also see economic dis disinformation taking place. And these are situations where governments and bad actors have tried to use COVID-19 to scare populations into economic downturns. One example that we monitored was when Prime Minister Boris Johnson of the UK came down sick with coronavirus. Um, as you may recall, he was hospitalized. He was given supplemental oxygen, which is simply a mask that allows you to breathe additional oxygen so you can help keep your breath. But when that story was being discussed, uh, pro-Kremlin out, pro -Kremlin outlets described it as him being on a ventilator, which may seem like um, uh, semantics, but they're quite different scenarios because uh, a ventilator is literally a machine that breathes for a person when they are unable to breathe for themselves. And they're only used when a person is near death because of COVID. And so based on our research, we believe that the reason why they were trying to do this was to stir up economic panic in the in the country because if the uk felt that they were leaderless at a time when they were still navigating brexit that it could cause markets to crash it could cause panic buying and the like elsewhere we've seen similar things happen uh but sometimes uh in in different forms so for example pro kremlin outlets also targeted baltic countries by saying that baltic nations economies were going to collapse because of covid and that uh, their, the balance of trade would get so bad that people would be financially ruined and that the only solution to it would be for the Baltic nations to turn economically back to Russia away from uh, the EU and the West. And these were not fact-based uh, stories. They were merely done to incite fear uh, among citizens in the Baltic nations. Meanwhile, another category that we've observed on a regular basis uh, are cases of political and religious exploitation. People with their personal ambition or political ideology wanting to rally their bases around an issue that they think that will make them stronger in their local or domestic or international geopolitical environments. Uh, President Bolsonaro of Brazil is a good example of this. Uh, very early on, he claimed that uh, that coronavirus was was nothing but a little flu, that it wasn't to be taken seriously, and he helped uh, participate in protests against uh, closing up the economy, and actually had several health ministers uh, leave under pressure because uh, they wanted to enforce stricter measures. In Belarus, we had examples of President Lukashenko downplaying the virus and uh, discouraging uh, people from taking it too seriously. And it actually took pressure from civil society to get public health institutions and the Ministry of Health to really start recommending to people that they socially uh, distance from each other and wear masks. The last category that we have seen as a common occurrence of disinformation, uh, what we refer to as old narratives with a new twist. And these are conspiracy theories that have been recycled over the years, sometimes over the decades, that have worked in the past and because they've worked in the past are being deployed again. There was a rumor last summer in which uh, messages were bring, being spread in Italy that the government was about to start spraying towns uh, and city centers with some sort of chemicals to, uh, to combat the virus and that people should uh, bring in their uh, drying clothes and bring in the children and bring in their pets so they don't get directly exposed to chemicals. Uh, while it may sound a bit ridiculous, 
there is there are grains of truth to it in the sense that uh for example brazil uh sprayed um uh, communities to combat mosquitoes during the Zika crisis uh, in the United States, in places like Florida, where I grew up, it wasn't unusual to see pesticides being sprayed publicly to fight mosquitoes. There were even experiments early on uh, in this particular pandemic in China to see if drones could be used to spray disinfectants. And so like I said, there's a grain of truth to something like this actually happening. In this particular case, it wasn't true. But over the course of three weeks, we saw versions of this rumor mutate to more than three dozen different countries around the world. Around the world, They were adapted by language and cultural sensibilities and, and other things to make them sound more plausible in those communities. Now, who decided to uh, spread these rumors? Honestly, we don't know. There's no evidence that it was done by a government. It could simply have been worried citizens who uh, saw something happening in one community and wanted to spread it to concerned friends in another country. And uh, it spread through the grapevine until it got to the point where nearly 40 countries started experiencing this exact same rumor, even though they weren't based in reality. So in all of these cases, what you're seeing here uh, is a convergence of legitimate fears with a convergence of rapid idea sharing uh, and panic. And uh, in some cases, people and entities intentionally wanting to spread rumors to have some sort of advantage over another population, whether it's for local domestic political advantage or geopolitical advantage on a global scale. No matter what form it takes, though, the results are the same in the sense that we're all worse off for it because rumors surrounding coronavirus, uh, it wears away trust uh, in institutions, it wears away trust in science and public health, it wears away trust in uh, democracies being able to respond to the crisis uh, effectively. It wears away trust in each other because in so many places, COVID-19 has become so politicized, we don't believe what our neighbors are saying because uh, they have decided to believe only what a particular political base is rallying around. It's extremely dangerous because while if, if we're lucky that we will see some form of vaccine become available at, at some point in 2021, there is no obvious vaccine to disinformation. And there's no type of antibiotic you can take to cure it once we've all been infected by this type of distrust and fear. And it puts us in a position where if uh, political leaders aren't going to rise to the occasion that it's incumbent upon civil society and community-based uh, community organizations to do absolutely everything they can to restore a sense of normality and trust around public health. This goes for organizations, uh, nonprofits that have nothing to do with public health. Anyone that has constituencies that have been affected by the coronavirus and still maintain a modicum of trust with institutions in those communities. It's going to become incumbent upon those community institutions to uh, rhetorically hold their hand and, and guide them back to a sense of reality and a sense of, of, of uh, normalcy when it comes to understanding what's true and what's not, what's effective and what's not. And so not all of us think of ourselves as activists in a public health space or civil society leaders in a public health space, but that's where we are right now. And so if you leave uh, my talk today with uh, any thoughts or any questions on what you can be doing, I would ask you to step back and think about how can the mission of your organizations serve to restore trust in your communities? You may not be public health experts or experts in science, but you're all experts in the communities that you serve. And somehow we're all going to have to get back to normal. And there's no way that 
random white guys like me can simply drop into a local population somewhere and give a talk like this and convince people that the right thing to do is to believe in science again and to trust uh, public institutions again. It's going to take the community organizations and the community institutions that they already trust and recognize because they are part of those communities and are of those communities. So I hope all of you, even though I know this isn't exactly an optimistic message, I think hopefully it will help you think about how you can perhaps take a more active role in restoring trust in your communities and ultimately be being part of the solution. So not only are we able to combat the virus in the public health sense, but we can also combat the virus in the sense of the infodemic as well. Thank you very much.